Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. America's longest war seemingly is now over. The head of the U.S. Central Command, General Kenneth McKenzie Jr., announced on Monday afternoon that the last U.S. plane in Afghanistan had cleared that country's airspace. For many years, the war in Afghanistan was seen as, well, the good war, even as the war in Iraq was falling apart. But in 2019, we learned through the reporting of Craig Whitlock of the Washington Post that those who were conducting and fighting the war in Afghanistan were actually alarmed by how things were going there, even right from the beginning, while the government publicly gave the impression that things were progressing. Craig Whitlock now joins me. Craig Whitlock is an investigative reporter for the Washington Post. His reporting from 2019 has now been turned into a book that is being published today. It's called The Afghanistan Papers, A Secret History of the War. He joins me via Zoom. Craig Whitlock, it is a great pleasure to welcome you to this program. Thank you for taking time to join me today. You bet. Happy to be here. My understanding is you've been covering the war in Afghanistan right from the beginning. Uh, you were a correspondent in Afghanistan. Later years, you would be a reporter covering the Pentagon, still covering from the Pentagon, uh, the war in Afghanistan. Here we are 20 years later, almost, and and uh, now it's seemingly the war is over. Is, is it a strange feeling at all for you? Well, it is. I mean, I think we all can sort of measure chronologically our lives by what's happened in Afghanistan. Uh, I My son was nine months old when I first when September 11th happened. And a few months after that, right after his first birthday, I made my first reporting trip to the region. You know, he's now 20 years old and a college junior. He's the same age as a number of the Marines who were killed in, in that tragic uh, suicide bombing in Kabul the other day. Uh, and when you think that the last Americans who service members who gave their lives, who sacrificed for their country in Afghanistan, uh, were just infants when the war started. It's, you know, it, it's always hard to cope with loss of life of American service members. But when you think that, you know, these young men and women really, you know, their whole lives, all they had known was a war in Afghanistan. And here they were uh, trying to help people get out. And it's it's just a lot to get your head around and cope with the fact that it's dragged on for as long as it did. Tell me about these documents that you obtained in year 2019 that you went and wrote a number of articles for the Washington Post, a special series, uh, but as well as what would accumulate into this book that you're publishing. Sure. So the first batch of documents we got were notes and transcripts of about 400 interviews that an obscure government agency called the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan had conducted uh, with people who played key roles in the war, everybody from White House officials and generals in the military to aid workers and Afghans or others on the front lines. Uh, this, these interviews were carried out for a project called Lessons Learned, ironically, that the Inspector General, uh, starting in 2015, wanted to sort of understand what went wrong in Afghanistan and apply those lessons to the future. Um, we thought that those interviews and notes were public record. Uh, the inspector general didn't want to disclose them. So we had to file two Freedom of Information Act lawsuits against the federal government uh, to make them public. It took us three years to get that initial batch of records, uh, a couple thousand pages. And that was the basis for the series that we published in the Washington Post back in December 2019. Uh, for the book that has just come out, we've gotten additional documentation from those interviews, as well as uh, several hundred other interviews, oral history interviews with U.S. service members, particularly in the Army, as well as senior Bush administration officials. They were interviewed uh, by historians at the, at the University of Virginia for another oral history project. So we've combined all those records to sort of get firsthand accounts of what went wrong in Afghanistan and, and mistakes that were made during the past 20 years. Was there anything that surprised you that came from the interviews with former Bush administration officials? Well, lots. And, you know, they were very frank. And these interviews had been given uh, starting in 2010. So, you know, a decade ago. But because this was an oral history project for presidential historians, these interviews were uh, kept under wraps or were only released to the public within the past year or so. So these people were speaking for posterity. I, and I think in that sense, 
they were much more direct and frank in in admitting things that had gone wrong in Afghanistan. Uh, you know, there was one in particular with former Defense Secretary Robert Gates. He was the Defense Secretary first under Bush and then under Obama. And he said things like, you know, when the war started, we didn't know jack shit about Al Qaeda. You know, and, you know, this is a, a direct quote from his transcript. He was talking about how we got into this war without really knowing who the enemy was. He also spoke frankly about when he was hired by Bush or named by Bush to be the defense secretary, he told the president, look, your your strategy in Afghanistan isn't making any sense. You need to scale it back. You need to, you know, really change your whole approach. Uh, and he was right. But, you know, this was also a problem under Obama as well. And this is a problem that they never really solved, which was what were we really trying to accomplish over there? Uh, what were the specific objectives and goals? And this was something that, uh, frankly, three presidents all struggled with. I mean, we went into Afghanistan, what, about two months after the 9-11 attacks? Uh, just one month. On October 7th, uh, 2001, is when President Bush authorized the beginning of the bombing campaign. Uh, right around that time, that's when uh, U.S. Special Forces went in on the ground, and also there had been CIA operatives there. Uh, but at that time, as you may recall, the, the mission seemed pretty narrow and pretty clear. It was to prevent another September 11 type attack on the United States. It was most Americans, not all, but most Americans supported the idea. They were very uh, afraid, quite frankly, of what might happen with more terrorist attacks. And, you know, there was a lot of pressure to go after Osama bin Laden and his organization. But uh, within six months, really, uh, Al Qaeda had been all but eliminated from Afghanistan. Its leaders had been killed, captured, or had fled the country. So the original objective had been accomplished. Uh, but that's when things started to change. The war started to drift. Mission creep set in. And uh, things kind of went on autopilot, largely because uh, the Bush administration quickly pivoted to planning for the invasion of Iraq. You also had access to former Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld's personal memos that he would create. And I think they called them snowflakes. And really early on in, in the war in Afghanistan, he, he wrote this, quote, and I get this from your book, I may be impatient. In fact, I know I'm a bit impatient. We are never going to get the U.S. military out of Afghanistan unless we take care to see that there is something going on that will provide the stability that will be necessary for us to leave. And then he added, help. Um, that, how early in the, uh, did that memo come out in, in the war? Well, that timing is really important. Not only is that a remarkable memo, here, here is Rumsfeld saying help with an exclamation point, saying we need a plan so we can get out of Afghanistan. Uh, but he said this just six months into the war. In fact, he wrote that memo on the very same day that President Bush gave a speech at the Vir Virginia Military Institute in which he was talking about, uh, you know, what we his plans for Afghanistan and kind of... Uh, you know, he was kind of basking in the limelight a little bit because at that time his popularity ratings were very high in the opinion polls and they thought they had won the war, quite frankly. Uh, but Bush was dismissing the idea in his speech that we could get stuck in Afghanistan. He, he promised Americans it wouldn't turn into a quagmire like Vietnam. Uh, and yet on that very same day, here's Donald Rumsfeld, his defense secretary, uh, openly worrying in, in, in this memo to his generals and other aides that, look, if we don't get a plan, uh, we could get stuck. So it was a real contrast between what was being said in public and what they really thought in private. Was there no sense of this as, as somebody who was reporting this uh, about the war at the time? I, I know you were tipped off to this report from the inspector general in two, around 2016. Uh, but I mean, was there, if, if we have all these people who are participating in this war expressing their concerns about the war. Um, was there no inkling uh, about this? Well, I think people knew all along, obviously, the war in Afghanistan hadn't been going well by 2016. You know, the fact that it, at that point, 15 years, if, if you've been at war for 15 years, by definition, it's not going very well, particularly if it's a war that you started. Uh, but I think at that point, uh, people were still holding a lot of their criticism close to the vest, uh, particularly in Washington. It's a very political and partisan town. And 
people don't like to speak out in public. Uh, the nature of these interviews that the inspector general had done Again, there's a lot of irony here. They were supposed to be the basis for a series of public reports about what went wrong in Afghanistan. And, and the inspector general did issue a series of these reports focusing on things like corruption in Afghanistan and the heroin production in Afghanistan, things like that. But what they did is they sanitized these reports and they omitted all the very harsh criticism that they had collected in the interviews. And they didn't name any of these people or very few. So I had gotten a tip that these interviews were much more revealing uh, with some real, real revelations in them. So we thought this is all public record. None of it was classified. So we, we asked to have a look. Uh, but it, the inspector general, for whatever reason, didn't want to release it and fought us in court for several years. In fact, we still have a lawsuit going under the Freedom Information Act to get more of these interviews and, and more parts that were withheld from us, because we think it's really important that the American people deserve to know uh, who these people were, what their criticisms were, so we, we can learn from our mistakes in Afghanistan. It seems troubling to me. An inspector general in, in the government is a very important role. Each department has its own inspector general. It's an independent sort of officer within a department who is tasked with investigating the department to find corruption or wrongdoing or whatever it may be. So the fact that and we put a lot of faith in, in inspector general. So the fact that uh, this inspector general would sanitize uh, the reports in his, in his public uh, reports is seems, seems troubling. Did you ever talk to the inspector general? Uh, I did a number of times. I tried every which way I could think of to try and pry these documents loose. And uh, I never really got a good explanation. The, the Inspector General John Sopko is appointed by Congress. It's a little different. He's appointed by Congress, not the president, to investigate allegations of fraud, waste, and abuse in Afghanistan. And normally he's he's a bit of a media hound. He likes to give interviews. He likes uh, the news attention. But in this case, his argument was, you know, we had promised these people we wouldn't name them, and that's why they spoke so frankly. Uh, my counter argument was, well, the law is very clear on this. The public records law says, you know, this information should be made public. It, you know, it maybe it'll you didn't have the authority to, to promise these people confidentiality. But it, it, the, there's an overriding public interest in knowing uh, what these people who are directly involved in the war were saying about the mistakes that were made and how the strategy didn't make any sense. I mean, they were really, really frank. Uh, you know, there was, there was a lot of backbiting, there was a lot of finger pointing, but it was very raw, these interviews. But, you know, in the end, we did win in court, and these records were made public over the objections of the Inspector General. But, uh, you know, the response we've gotten to people who've read our coverage and are reading the book, I think, you know, no one's, no one's arguing that this stuff should be kept secret. It's, there's no question that the public deserves to know these assessments and hear these comments from people who were involved in the war. Craig Whitlock, your book, again, is called The Afghanistan Papers. Obviously, we think of the Pentagon Papers that were released by Daniel Ellsberg during the Vietnam War. Compare and contrast what you had compared to what the Pentagon Papers were. Well, there's some real similarities, but also some clear differences. Uh, one of the differences is the Pentagon Papers was a classified study of Vietnam. So this was meant to be a military secret from the beginning. And Daniel Ellsberg, as you mentioned, who, who was involved in compiling them, he, he leaked copies of them to the New York Times, the Washington Post, and other news organizations because he thought there was an overriding public interest in finding out what this secret study showed about Vietnam. You know, it showed that the government had lied to the American people about how the U.S. had been drawn into the war and, and certain things that it did. Uh, the Afghanistan papers, were, none of them were classified. Th these were originally all uh, unclassified. The only, after the Washington Post asked for the documents, the inspector general tried to have some of them classified as a way to keep them out of our hands. Uh, but we, we mostly won that battle. Uh, the other difference is the Pentagon Papers, it was a study commissioned by former Defense Secretary Robert McNamara. It was meant to be kept secret internally, but he, McNamara was so worried that word would get out about the Pentagon Papers that he ordered Ellsberg and the other people behind it not to interview anyone. It was all based on documents like government memos, diplomatic cables, uh, intelligence assessments, 
but they weren't allowed to interview anybody. Uh, in contrast, the Afghanistan papers is almost all interviews. It's interviews with people who played a role in the war and it's notes and transcripts of their personal assessments. So uh, in that sense, the Afghanistan papers, uh, you know, there's a lot more stories, anecdotes, complaints, criticism, you know, what you would expect when you interview 400 people to get their personal assessments of what went wrong. They're a lot more lively and frank and, you know, some of their stories kind of make your eyes pop out. One of those people who were interviewed with the Lesson Learned series was Jeffrey Eggers, who was a Navy SEAL, and, and you quote him in the book, and he says this, quote, the, the complexities will take a long time to unravel. Our entire post-9-11 response is all subject to question because of this increasing complexity. Why did we make the Taliban the enemy when we were attacked by Al-Qaeda? Why did we want to defeat the Taliban? Why do we think it was necessary to build a hyper-functioning state to forego the return of the Taliban? That seemed really telling to me, a line of thought that we get from these reports, is that it wasn't, is that, I think here in the United States, we hardly were told and, and saw the difference between Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, whereas the reality on the ground in Afghanistan was very different. And it seems to, this is one of the things that seems to get to the heart of what was happening. Yeah, you know, you're right. And that was a very good interview in the sense that Eggers, I think, is a reflective person. And he was raising some excellent questions. You know, the, you know, as you point out, the whole war was because of Al Qaeda, uh, but Al Qaeda was gone after six months. So how did we get drawn into a war for the next two decades with the Taliban? The Taliban wasn't responsible for September 11th. Uh, no Afghans were involved in the 9-11 terrorist attacks. And his point was, we, we really were kind of, you know, searching around for an enemy. You know, the Taliban was shooting at us, so we started shooting at them. And we didn't know how we got drawn into this long, drawn-out conflict with them. Um, and, and he's right about that, right? In the beginning of the war, you'll recall, I think, Mitch, you know, we the Bush administration had a tendency to lump uh, people in the same basket. You know, al-Qaeda were terrorists, and that's clear, they were. But... They also called the Taliban terrorists and a number of other jihadi groups terrorists. And, you know, they were all painted with the same brush, even though, uh, you know, I'm not trying to excuse the Taliban. They're a very brutal regime, uh, but they, they weren't involved in a direct fight with the United States. We kind of got involved in an Afghan civil war, a conflict that's been going on in that country for decades. And because we we really grouped the Taliban and Al Qaeda together. We couldn't distinguish between the two. And, you know, that's a major reason why we were there for as long as they were. This is something you also hear in other interviews in the Afghanistan papers, even from soldiers on the front lines, they would say, they would talk about the enemy in terms of bad guys and good guys. So, you know, when they would talk about who they're fighting, they would say, well, we're after the bad guys, but they wouldn't, they couldn't define who the bad guys were. There was one, interview with the special forces combat advisor who said uh, whenever a new unit would come into Afghanistan, they would say, you know, show us the bad guys. Where are the bad guys so we can go so we can go kill the bad guys? And he said, it's not so simple as that. There aren't just bad guys and good guys over here. You know, how, we, we have to distinguish, you know, who's the enemy? But that very basic question, who's the enemy? Uh, you know, if you can't tell who the enemy is, and you're fighting a war, you, you've got real problems. But this is something we struggled with for many years. Was the Taliban the enemy or not? Why were we fighting the Taliban? And even in recent weeks, you know, U.S. military has actually been working uh, cooperatively in some regards with the Taliban. And it's I think it's thrown a lot of Americans for a loop who are trying to figure out, OK, what was this war about? Who are we fighting and why? It, it always seems to change. How then do we get to this transition early on in this war from going from a war that was about driving out Al Qaeda to one that became one about nation building? That's another really good question. And the irony here is that uh, President Bush, President Obama and President Trump all promised in public to the American people that they would not involve, get involved in a quote-unquote nation-building campaign in Afghanistan. And yet, uh, over the last 20 years, the United States has spent more than $130 billion trying to build up the Afghan government, the Afghan state, uh, building schools and hospitals and 
roads and, and trying to stand up an Afghan army and police force. So we spent more money adjusted for inflation in Afghanistan on nation building than we did in Europe with the Marshall Plan after World War II, uh, which kind of puts it into perspective just how much we, we spent over there. And yet now there's really very, very little to show for it uh, as, as with the Taliban peeking over. Uh, the presidents kept saying we weren't going to do this, but frankly, after Bush ordered the invasion of Afghanistan, the country was just so devastated from uh, 20 years of war over there, from the Russians, from the Afghans' own civil war, that you know there was no way we could really just leave the country. I mean, it was they didn't have electricity. Uh, there were millions of refugees. There was real concern about a famine setting in. This was a really, really beaten down, destroyed country. And we had an obligation to try and help them stand up. Uh, but again, the, the problem politically was that Bush had promised during his campaign against Al Gore in 2000 that he would not use the U.S. military for any nation building campaigns. He had been very critical of Clinton and Gore for doing this in the Balkans, in Somalia and Haiti. Uh, but yet now he sort of had to do that in Afghanistan, but he didn't want to admit it. Uh, and this is the same problem that happened with Obama. You know, he promised not to do nation building in Afghanistan, and uh, he spent more money than Bush did there. And even Trump, same thing. So all these presidents promising we wouldn't do it, uh, yet they were doing it anyway. And the manner in which they did it was was not very effective. Was there a conscious effort, a concerted effort to make the war appear that it was going better than it actually was here in the United States? Absolutely. And we document this in the book page after page. And it, it goes beyond just uh, the usual political spin or happy talk. Uh, it gets to the point where we cite example after example where they would say something in public that they knew not to be true. I mean, you mentioned about Rumsfeld's memo just six months in the war where he's almost panicking that they don't have a plan to get out and they're worried about getting stuck. And yet Bush in public is saying, oh, no, we're not worried about that. We're not going to get stuck. Um, you know, soon after Rumsfeld did this quite often in May 2003, uh, Rumsfeld went to Kabul and declared an end to major combat operations in Afghanistan. He said the Taliban had been vanquished and he said, you know, the, you know combat's over. And yet in interviews for the book that we obtained, oral history interviews, army officers who were on the ground in Afghanistan at the time said they couldn't believe it, what Rumsfeld said. They said there was never any order to end combat operations. And in fact, combat operations were still ongoing, major ones in which they were engaged in firefights with the Taliban in eastern Afghanistan. So, you know, this is one example of, frankly, a lie that Rumsfeld had said. Uh, there was another example four years later in 2007 uh, Vice President Cheney visited Afghanistan on an unannounced trip. He was at Bagram Air Base, which was our major military installation. And the Taliban carried out a suicide bombing at the front gates of Bagram and immediately announced that Cheney had been the target. Uh, Cheney wasn't hurt. He was at Bagram. But immediately the U.S. military denied that Cheney was ever in danger and adamantly uh, denied the Taliban's charge that uh, Cheney could have been the target. They said they the Taliban couldn't have known where Cheney was, that this was just a total coincidence. But again, in documents we got for the book, an army officer who was in charge of security at the air base that day and was in charge of helping uh, Cheney stay safe uh, said, no, the Taliban actually came within 30 minutes of killing Cheney when he was supposed to leave. So again, these are hmm. specific incidents where they're just, simp not only are they not telling the truth, they're, they're flat out lying about it, but as the years went on, the other thing you would hear time and again from generals and presidents and ambassadors, they would always say, we're making progress in the war. Uh, we're making progress. We're turning the corner. Uh, we're going to be victorious. We're going to win. And yet time and again in, in the Afghanistan papers, you hear from either those same people or other U.S. officials who said they knew that wasn't true. They were just trying to you know, keep public opinion on their side the longer the war went on. But that, you know, even in recent months, there was never any admission that the Taliban could take over, that we could lose this war. So really, up until the end, U.S. officials didn't tell the truth about how the war was going. Even when Biden was saying that he, you know, he, he didn't think that the fall of Afghanistan would happen so soon. 
Well, that's right. Now, it's possible Biden just made a terrible misjudgment. Uh, you know, of course, he couldn't see into the future. He was dismissive of this idea that uh, we would have what what was called a Saigon moment in Afghanistan, where we'd have helicopters evacuating people off the embassy roof as they did in Vietnam in 1975. Uh, I, I think he was just, frankly, they were caught by surprise that the Afghan government collapsed as quickly as, as it did. And we ended up having, uh, frankly, another Saigon moment in Kabul, where we had U.S. military transport planes taking off with Afghans clinging, clinging to the outside of the, the aircraft. Uh, but certainly that's another theme throughout this book and throughout the last 20 years is not only were U.S. officials not telling the truth, but they, they never fundamentally understood Afghanistan. Uh, they made miscalculation after miscalculation about politics there, about how society worked, and made a lot of misjudgments about what we could hope to accomplish. One last question here. I know we're, we're, we're almost out of time, but what do you think was or were the drivers of keeping this war going then, considering everything that you've reported about uh, and have written about in the Afghanistan papers? And I guess for me, one thing I think about is you mentioned how much money was spent in Afghanistan. And whenever you have conflict, whenever you have war, there are interests that suddenly become attached to that war, political interests, economic interests. Those are my words, but I'm curious of for all this work that you've done on this, what do you think the drivers were of keeping us in this war for so long? Well, I think that's a very legitimate question. There, you know, we spent two trillion dollars in Afghanistan over the last twenty years, and a lot of people and contractors uh, made out very well from that. Um, I guess, though, I look at it slightly differently after doing all my research and reading these interviews. You know, thousands of them. Um, I think that the people in position of power, the people who are running the government, whether it was under Bush, Obama, Trump, and of course at the end Biden, I think they were all afraid to admit they were losing a war, that they were slowly losing a war that Americans once thought we had won. Uh, you have to remember Afghanistan is very different from Iraq in the beginning. Uh, you know, more than 80% of Americans at first supported the decision to send U.S. troops to Afghanistan back in 2001 and 2002. Again, this was seen as a war of self-defense, that it was a just cause. There were some people who were against it, no question, and warned of problems to come. But, you know, people understood this war wouldn't have happened if September 11th hadn't happened first. It's very different from Iraq, where we went in on false pretenses to invade another country. Uh, and People assumed we had won this war in early 2002, once the Taliban was removed from power and U.S. troops had control of the country. So I think from that point forward, for a president or a general or an ambassador to say, we're losing this war that we had won, that's politically, that's a very, very difficult thing to do. So I think it was a lot easier, a lot less courageous, but a lot easier for people to just say, well, we're making progress and just kick the can down the road and, and not really confront the reality of what's going on. So to me, it's it's really a lack of courage uh, to admit what had happened. People just didn't want to admit or take responsibility for the fact that uh, they were losing war that Americans thought they, they had won. Do you think part of it was they knew and always felt that the Taliban probably would take over once they left? Yes, absolutely. And in fact, this is the a dichotomy, a paradox you see time and again that the generals would say, we're going to win, we're going to win, we're going to defeat the Taliban. Uh, and yet, at the same time, in these interviews for the Afghanistan papers, they acknowledge that uh, this was an unwinnable war, that the Taliban couldn't be destroyed, that they were too part of a fabric of, of society in Afghanistan. And there had to be some kind of political reconciliation uh, to bring the Taliban into the political system in Afghanistan. Uh, that never happened. And because it didn't. The Taliban just knew they could buy their time. They were getting stronger and stronger while the Afghan government, in spite of all the money invested, was getting weaker and weaker and less legitimate in the eyes of the Afghan people. So uh, the Taliban had a saying, uh, they would tell the Americans, you have all the clocks, but we have all the time. They knew it was just a matter of time till the Americans left. And as long as they could hang on, they would they would win in the end. And, and they were right. 
Craig Whitlock is an investigative reporter with the Washington Post. He is the author of the book, The Afghanistan Papers, A Secret History of the War. It's out today. Craig Whitlock, thank you for your time. Absolutely. Thanks so much for the discussion. Really enjoyed it.